Lord, this morning, and we're going to continue with our study of the book of Acts. But first, I have to tell you about a terrible tragedy in my home Friday night as I went, went home to continue my preparations, all of my notes, all of my study materials, all of my everything on my computer crashed, died. I thought, what am I going to do? And so, um, so it's going to be, we're going to be a, a little bit adjusted this morning. I tried to console myself by saying, well, remember back at the beginning, they didn't have computers and, and Bible soft programs and all of this, but I still struggled. <laughs> so, but anyhow, I appreciate your prayer. So those of us, um, it's been a couple of weeks, but if you have your, uh, our, the handouts, the Acts handouts, um, I don't have a handout for you today. And you know why now, because my computer completely crashed and didn't, did not resurrect. It's going to take uh, Dr. Nomer when he comes back from the Philippines. He's going to try to, he's going to try to, that's, we will receive Rema today. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Um, if you have your, if you have this with you, we'll do, this is from the last handout. You'll see some of this, especially as you turn to, uh, on the last page, a little bit, little bit of it, but not a lot. But because the Lord really put in my heart that as we go from week to week in our study of Acts, that you have something that will give you an overall study of the book of Acts, I will Next week, um, I will have a handout for you of what we've been going over and then moving ahead as well. So thank you for your grace in this, in this area. Um, bless her heart. We wouldn't even have a PowerPoint today either, except late last night, Melrose was still down here in TST, and she sent me a text, and she said, I'll make the PowerPoint for you. I said, no, 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 go home, go home. She says, no, 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 I'm going back to the church already. So bless her heart, she took part of what I'd done two weeks ago and then, and then put it together, or else we would... It really would be pen and paper today, so um, so just bear with me. It's a little bit. We'll we'll get through it. We'll get through it with the Lord's help. Amen. We want to continue this morning. We're still in chapter one of the book of Acts. What a great study for us, brothers and sisters. Really, the book of Acts to me is it's 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 basic for every Christian. For every Christian. It gives us a blueprint. It gives us an example. Sometimes we get to, you know, we sometimes look at, at, at the writings of Paul and, and s some of these things and we think, well, how does that work out? You know, it's hard to sometimes to take it from the doctrine to make it apply to our lives. But we get into the book of, when we look at the book of Acts and we see the pictures and we see these early Christians interacting, we really get a good idea of this is what real Christianity looks like. This is what Christian living is like. And I don't know about you, but for me, it is a challenge and an encouragement in both ways because sometimes I come to the book of Acts, both as a Christian and as a minister, and I look at this and I think, wow, my Christian life is quite a bit below what I see in the book of Acts. And I don't believe there's anything in the Bible that is just there so we can look up to it and just say, Wow, look at them. Wow, I really admire them. God has included what He has in His Word that you and I might see, know, understand, and walk towards and work towards all that God has for us with the help and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And the book of Acts shows us this. So we continue this morning, and I want us to start... Uh, where we, where we camped part of the time a couple of weeks ago. Look back with me at Acts 1-3, and we're looking at several different translations, but we see here in Acts 1-3 that during the 40 days after his crucifixion, he, Jesus, appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways, or he gave many convincing proofs that he was actually alive. I want us to talk about these convincing proofs a little bit more and apply it to our lives in the 21st century this morning. What does this mean? Why is this important to you and to me this morning when this is something that was over 2,000 years ago and wasn't Jesus just interacting with his 12 disciples? And it's just for us to look back and say, okay, that's what he did then. But we're gonna, as we're going to see this morning, that what we read here and what we see here is so applicable. It's so appropriate for you and for me today. In, on September, we're not in September yet. 
August 28th. See, when I don't have my computer, I'm just all messed up. August 28th, 2016. So what are the things we, if you'll remember from a couple of weeks ago, what were the convincing proofs? What about, first of all, what is a proof? He uses this word, demonstrated decisive evidence. So that's the word, that's the meaning of the word proof, demonstrated decisive evidence. So I want you to think about that because we're going to look at two parts this morning, at, at two different ways of, of, of evidence, if you will. There is that part that can be proven. It can be seen, it can be heard, it can be touched. It is something that, um, that people have to, unless they are completely intellectually dishonest, people have to say, yes, it's real, yes, it's true. And we'll talk a little bit more about this because you know what? You will find, there, that you, you will find in this world there are very honest skeptics and honest atheists and honest doubtful Christians and you will also always find dishonest atheists, dishonest skeptics and dishonest doubtful Christians and we're going to look at we're going to look at that this morning as we come in, as, as we look at this. So Jesus gave proof that he was alive. Why does he give proof? Why does Luke write so much about this? Why is there such an emphasis on this? Because they, these disciples, are going to have to know in their own lives and they're going to have to give this message to a world in which there are many other gods that are worshipped, many other beliefs. They're going to face opposition. They're going to face skepticism just as you face skepticism. They're going to face people who are going to say, that's fine, you believe Jesus, I believe something else. And that's important because for us in the world today, that is a very, very strong part of our culture. Especially those of you that, are wor that work with young people or you're part of universities, high schools and universities, it's called the, it, the postmodern culture, if you will. And, and what it means is you can believe what you believe and that's okay. I can believe what I can believe, I believe, and that's okay. It's all good. It's all okay. And Jesus worked with his disciples, and Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, works with you and me today to say, no, that's not the way it is. It's not, okay, you can believe this, and I can believe that, and it's all good. It's all good. Jesus gives demonstrated, decisive, convincing proof that he's alive. And that's the foundation of Christianity. That's the foundation of our faith. That's the foundation of our, our belief. That's why I told you a couple of weeks ago when people say, say to me, okay, well, it's good that you believe that. I'm glad you have something to believe in. It makes you, it comforts you in this tough world. That just drives me crazy. I want to hit people when, when they say that because who, who wants to believe a lie? I don't want to believe a lie. I want to believe what's true. And if it's not true, I don't want to believe it. And if I can poke holes in it, it's not the religion for me. And if it cannot be relied upon, I don't want to rely upon it. Because we live in a world that is too tough for that. To, do, to depend on something that's halfway true, halfway lie, that may be true for you but not true for this person. True in America, you know, but not true in Asia. No. And so Jesus answers this as he comes into this. So he gave many convincing proofs. So let's look at that. We talked about this last time. What's the first thing he does? He appeared to them. And remember that word appeared is the Greek word. It's the word that we get, that we use, those of us that have glasses, ophthalmologist, um, uh, uh, um, and other words that are related to that. It has to do with the eyeball, okay? It has to do with the eyeball. And so Jesus let them eyeball him, if you will. That's an American slang. They eyeballed him. He appeared to them. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't a, a hoax. It wasn't a hallucination. He appeared. They could see him. Ah, but that's not all he did. What else did he do? Because he gave many convincing proofs, right? What else? He spoke to them. It wasn't just a feeling in their hearts. Now, do you ever have a feeling in your heart? Yes. Is it God? Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it's just a feeling, isn't it? Sometimes, Brother Stephen, you ate too much pepper with your meal. And it's, you know, it's just, and it's just a feeling. And it's not, now, honestly, I'm not making fun of the Lord's leading, but 
Sometimes feelings are just feelings, but he spoke to them. So there's something objective, right? This morning, would any of you say, I'm just imagining Pastor Jennifer speaking to me? It's in my heart. No, you hear my voice with your ears, right? It is a convincing proof. If every one of you walked out of that door and you were interviewed by a, a reporter or by, a, or by an attorney or something like that, you'd all say the same thing. We heard Pastor Jennifer speak. It is a convincing proof, yeah? Okay, third, what, what, what did he do? He, and this is a big one. For us, it's kind of like, huh? He ate with them. He ate with them. Now, why is that a big deal? Remember, the Jews believed that ghosts cannot eat. Okay? Ghosts don't eat. And so, and they were all Jewish, right? They were all Jewish disciples. So if Jesus ate broiled fish, the Bible tells us, and other things, he ate broiled fish, he could not be a ghost. That was what, that was convincing for them. Okay? Now, for some of you, that might not be convincing. Ghosts don't eat broiled fish. But if you, if Jesus, if this were a different situation in a different culture, in a different time, in a different place, Jesus would give many convincing proofs to you to show you that he's alive. So he does all of this. He appears, he speaks, he eats with them. Why is this so important? They had to be convinced of the fact Jesus is alive. And Jesus, he is the, found, the, the living Jesus is the foundation of our faith, brothers and sisters. The foundation. That's why Paul says, is it 1 Corinthians 15 or, or somewhere there? He says, if, if, we, if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then we are of all people the most miserable. The most miserable. And so, so it, it, we have to be convinced of that. Jesus is a living Savior. Jesus is alive. They had to have it for themselves, and they had to be convinced of that because they were the ones to bear witness to the living Jesus in a hostile world. In a hostile world. Now, I hope you see the connections already and the applications already because just as they had to bear witness of a living Jesus in a hostile world, you and I have to bear witness of a living Jesus in a hostile world. They're going tomorrow into a very hostile world where Jesus is not Lord and Savior. Somebody else is. They're going to have to bear witness. But now we face a difficulty as we look at this. How can we bear witness of a living Jesus when we did not see Jesus with our eyes? We have not heard Jesus with our ears. We have not seen him eat broiled fish. How are we going to give a witness, an objective witness, a, a demonstrated, a demonstrable, convincing witness and proof to a skeptical world that Jesus is alive. How is that going to happen to you and me? We can point them back to this, and we're going to look at a few things this morning, but I think there is something else that is part of this. Because Jesus gave convincing proofs, but then he also said there was another part of it. There's the objective part, but then there is the subjective part. So those of you that say, what are you talking about, Pastor Jennifer? There is the part that you can prove. It is a demonstration. There is the part that has to do with experience. That's the subjective part, okay? So if you don't remember those words, that's okay. Just remember the two different parts. There's the part that you can prove it. You can hear my voice, okay? You can see me. I could tap you on the shoulder. It is demonstrated. It's provable. But then there is the other part. There's the other part, and that's the experience part of being, the Christ of being a Christian, of having a relationship with the living Jesus. And that's why in this first part, Jesus says in Acts 1-4 and then Acts 1-8, here's the experience part, but you will receive what? Power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. When you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's what that is. When you're baptized, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit is come upon you and you will be 
my witnesses. So there is the experience part. Do you see that? There's the subjective part. There's going to be an experience with the living Jesus. He is going to live inside. He's going to live inside them. But, and this is, at that point, he's already living inside them because, remember, Jesus said, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Remember that? The night of his resurrection. And then he says, but he's going to come in in a new way. He's with you. He's going to be in you. You will receive power. And here we see the other part of being a witness for Jesus. These disciples had seen Jesus. They knew he was alive. They knew he was real. But how are they going to transmit that? How are they going to convince a skeptical, unbelieving world of that? They're going to have to have more. And he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not a question of, okay, I'll take a class and I will learn. Yes, we can learn from classes. But the Holy Spirit, one of his works in your life and in my life is a trans forming power of life that makes your life to a skeptical world a demonstration of the living Jesus. Does that make sense to you? Yes. It should. <coughs> when, he, when he lives inside, when he fills you, when he takes over, when he does what he has been sent to do, he transforms your life and he makes you and he makes me into a witness for him. That's the only way. That's the only way in a skeptical and an unconvinced and an unconvinced and disbelieving and hostile world. That's why we're going to talk about it more. That's why we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a denominational thing. It's not a, oh, well, you, that's your experience and that's my experience. If we want to be what Jesus has called us to be, if we want to do what Jesus has called us to do, we have to receive what, who Jesus gives us to do and to be witnesses for him and to live for him. Amen? Amen. So there's the subjective part as well. It's the objective and the subjective. I want to encourage you this morning. We live in a world that has so many questions and where truth is so subjective these days. And I know we don't, I don't, we don't often talk about it in this way, but for many of us, this is, this is an issue. And we face people who are so skeptical about Jesus. We, we face people who are, have so many, so many quest questions. And sometimes we're scared of it, aren't we? We're a little, how am I going to answer that question? Well, I don't know. I want to tell you something this morning. I've studied a lot, but I'll tell you something. There are some questions I don't know how to answer either. I don't. I don't. I'm not an encyclopedia up here. I know a lot and I've studied a lot, but there's some questions I can't answer. But I'll tell you what. Do you know what I do sometimes with people if they're honest skeptics? I will say, I know what I believe. I know what I've experienced. I'm not quite sure how to answer you. Will you give me some time to think about it and a little bit more? And let's talk about it again. And if they are honest, if they're honest, they'll give you that chance because they want to know. And they want, they want, a, they want an answer to their question. They want to answer their question. They want to know, is this true? Is this not true? If they're not honest skeptics, if they're not honest atheists, brothers and sisters, you can't do anything. You, re you really can't. I've talked with people before. They'll say, but what about this? Oh, okay. But what about this? Yeah, 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 okay. Yes, but. And people like that, pff, don't waste your time. Honestly, don't, don't, don't waste your time. Because you know why? They don't want to believe. They don't want to believe. Here's one of the things. I look at, at Paul. If anybody could have been considered an atheist in those terms, Paul was an atheist. Now he believed, you say, yes, but no, but he was a Jew and he believed. Do you understand what I'm saying? He was an, he was an atheist. Jesus is not Lord. This, who is this person? 
strong in his belief, utterly convinced that the way of Jesus, this was false, this was, this was heresy, and he persecuted the way of God until he met the living Jesus. The living Jesus, right? And he was convinced. Just as there are those today. I, I brought some books this morning. And when I was uh, a university student a long time ago, he'd already been a Christian a long time, there was uh, a speaker who came to the University of Alabama and he spoke to many, many, a huge gathering and I didn't know that, I knew some about him, but um, he's been a Christian a long time. His name is Josh McDowell and he has a special calling and a special gifting, especially at university students and, and people have a lot of questions who are really skeptical. And he came and spoke, of course I was already a Christian, but there was a young man that lived in my apartment complex that absolutely was not a Christian. And he secretly went to this meeting and Josh McDowell just spoke about this is, this, these are the claims of Jesus, this is what he says, and this is why it's true. And this young man became a Christian, truly believed, and his life was changed from that point onward. And I, I think about Josh McDowell because you know how Josh McDowell became a Christian? He didn't have a Christian family. He didn't have a Christian upbringing or a Christian background. He was an atheist. He was an atheist. And he set out to prove all of this religious stuff about Jesus, it's lies, it's junk, it's a hoax, it's fake, it cannot be true. And in the course of his investigation, he came, because he was an honest atheist, he was an honest atheist, he came to see, I'm wrong. Jesus is true. Jesus is alive. And he wrote this book that's one of the classics. If you deal with people that are really skeptical, it's a huge, actually this is just volume one. There's, there are two volumes. And it's great as a reference book. And the name of it is Evidence That Demands a Verdict. It's a great reference book. We keep these in our library. If you have questions sometimes, like some people say to you, how do you know that the Bible's reliable? The Bible's not reliable because blah, 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 blah. And you stand there and you go, uh, and you don't know what to say, right? <laughs> Go get this book. Go get this book. Josh McDowell was one of them. He wrote another one. And this one is great, much simpler. It's called More Than a Carpenter. Excellent. And he talks about why Jesus is, a, is, is alive. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful. And it's, this was, has been given out on so many campuses. But he started out as an atheist, an honest atheist. And then there was another one. This is another great one, too, and this is in my personal library, Lee Strobel. He's an investigative reporter, very analytical. He, was, he would dig into all sorts of things, quite well known. He was award-winning, and he, was, he and his wife, Lee and Leslie, they were, they were atheists, and his wife informed him at one point, Lee, I now believe in Jesus. I have become a Christian, and he was horrified that his wife would believe such junk as that. And he set out as an investigative reporter to prove this Jesus stuff is not real. And in the course of his investigation, he came to be convinced that Jesus is who he says he is and that he's living. And out of that, he wrote The Case for Christ. He has another one, The Case for Faith. Parents, if you have young people um, that are skeptical or that are dealing, dealing with some of these things, he also has a book that is this, but it's especially for teenagers as well. It's an excellent, ex it's an excellent book. So I just want to encourage you, and I'm not preaching books this morning. I want to preach Jesus this morning. But, <laughs> but, but this gives you, there are honest atheists and there are honest skeptics out there. Now I want to say something else this morning to you this morning. By and large, generally, perhaps most if not all of us in this room this morning are Christians and we believe in Jesus. But you know what I have found, and I'm sure Pastor Renee would say the same thing, I have met a lot of Christians who are, skeptic, who are skeptical Christians. Really. How can I believe this? Well, what about this? Or I have so many questions about this, but how could God do this? How could God do that? I want to say something to you this morning. First of all, 
if you're a skeptical Christian, you make sure that you are an honest skeptical Christian. I mean it, because I've met dishonest skeptical Christians before. They just don't really want to follow Jesus that much. They don't want their life to be disciplined by truth. They don't want to, they don't want to really say, okay, Lord, you're Lord of my life. They kind of want to believe Jesus but live their own lives, you know. They don't want to believe all the parts of the Bible. So if you're a dishonest skeptic, you're in trouble. Really, you're in trouble. If you are an honest skeptic this morning, as a Christian, you have, you have real questions about this or about that. Well, why this and why that? I don't understand. I want to challenge you and encourage you this morning. Do not continue to live with your doubts and your questions. They will destroy your faith. They will destroy your faith foundation. If you have questions about God, if you have questions about the Holy Spirit, but what about this? Or you, if you have other serious questions, I mean, sometimes we all have questions about, well, how did, well, who did, who did Adam's children marry? Or, or, you know, things like that. <laughs> Had to marry their sisters. That's the only answer for that one, right? Don't get sidetracked by sideline issues, but I mean serious issues, serious issues. Do not continue to live with them in your life, and I mean that. It will eat you up on the inside. It will destroy you. You need to find the answers to your questions and to your doubts. And Jesus and Christianity is not some weak belief that has to be protected against any questions and oh we got to be careful well don't get don't be too no don't look too closely don't examine too closely Jesus and who he is and Christianity and God and his character and his nature can stand up to any question any question. You don't have to be afraid that you're going to get deep into learning about God or deep into your Christian walk and find out it's not really true. It can't be depended on. I believe this, but now I have no foundation for my faith. I promise you the sincere questions and doubts that you have can be answered. But don't just live with them. Don't just live with them. You start digging in the Bible. You start praying about them. I mean, really praying about them. Really praying about them. Or times when you come, you come to something in the Bible and you say, Lord, it's here, but I'm here. Have you ever come to a place like that? I've come that way as a pastor. And, and I've shared some of it before. There were some things that I thought, Lord, this is what you say, but I'm living down here. My level of faith is down here. It's not up there. I started praying about those things. God, I want to have faith for that. Because you can't just make up faith. You know, you can't just say, oh, okay. You can't just say, forget it, forget it. I won't think about the questions I'm just going to believe. Some things need to be answered. Some things need to be, need to be dug into. Some of these things, you've got to know that you know that you know. Because you're going to be in a world that's going to attack you. You think the devil's going to take it easy on you just because you're a baby Christian? You think the devil's going to take it easy on you because give me a little time to work this out? He doesn't fight fair. He doesn't play fair. You and I have to do what we can to find out what we need to find out. If you have doubts, you go to God. Honestly, He already knows you have doubts. No need to hide. Say, God, I, I'm doubting this. I, but Lord, I see the good things. And I, but Lord, I want to know. And you start digging. And you start looking in the Word. You pray. You talk to other Christians. And He will bring you to a place of confidence in Him and understanding in Him where the questions are answered and the doubts are settled. And then you can live and speak and be for Jesus what He's called you to be. And you will make it. You will make it. You will have a rock to stand on. You'll have a rock to stand on. And Jesus wants you to be there. He wants me to be there. Just as He gave convincing proofs to them. He will give convincing proofs to you. Do you think he loves you less than he loved them? Do you think so? Of course not. He wants you to be as convinced of his truth and his life as they were. This is what he wants for us. And so don't, don't sit back and wait. Dig in. Dig in. Amen? I want to move ahead just a little bit 
because I know our time's going to run away from us. I just wanted to, sh to share this. I shared it in the first service because because we're in the first chapter of Acts and we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit um, somewhat. We were, when I lived in Beijing, uh, when Sister Betty and I lived in Beijing, there was a woman who lived in the building with us and it, it this, so this has to do with what I'm talking about now, and we're going to be talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because Jesus told his disciples, you're going to be my witnesses, but first, don't leave Jerusalem. You wait here until you receive the gift that the Father has promised. You're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And this lady that lived in the building, we liked her so much, we became really good friends. This was in, when we were at Peking University. She loved God. She really did. And her, she came from a different denomination than, than a different denominational background. And her father was a pastor and had been a pastor for many years. And in her understanding and in her background and in her experience, all of this about the Holy Spirit, pff, that was for then and not for now. And she was very sincere. That was her background, that was her training. And she came to us one day and she asked us about it. She was sitting in our room and she said, tell me about the, you know, the Holy Spirit, you know, and then she started asking spe specific questions. And she asked a very specific question about, have you, because you know, she sort of knew us and she looked at us sideways like that. Said, have you ever spoken in tongues? You know, spoken in tongues. And we looked at her, we said, yes. And she said, you have? We said, yes. And she said, how many times? <laughs> <laughs> because she thought, okay, maybe one time, once, two words, a long time ago or whatever. And we looked at her and we said, every day? She almost fell out of her chair. Really, almost fell out of her chair. But she was an honest skeptic. That was her background. And she had been told, if somebody speaks in tongues today, it's from the devil. And she didn't want anything from the devil. Do you want something from the devil? Who wants something from the devil? She didn't want anything from the devil. But she had seen our lives and she saw something different. Now this goes back to what we said earlier. How are we witnesses? They saw Jesus. How are you and I witnesses for Jesus? How do we show Jesus to a disbelieving world? They will see Jesus in us. I love what it, hang on to that and I'll come back to that. But remember what it says in John chapter 1. The Word became flesh. The Word is Jesus. Remember that? The Word became flesh and made His what? Dwelling with us. That's what Jesus did. But brothers and sisters, Jesus is back in heaven. How is Jesus going to make His dwelling with people today? How is Jesus going to be in the flesh today? He's going to be in the flesh today to show the world in your life and in my life. I, I, I don't want to speak heresy, but do you understand what I'm saying? The Word became flesh. When Jesus makes His home in our hearts and in our lives through the Holy Spirit and our lives are transformed and suddenly like Stephen the, like Steve, Stephen the heathen, Big Steve, you know, remember his testimony. His life, the, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not saying bad things about him. That's what Stephen said his, na his nickname was. He was Stephen the heathen. His life was transformed and there was an objective. Objective. There's something different here. We can see it. We can hear it. We can feel it. That's how Jesus is going to demonstrate himself to the world today. It's going to be in your life and in my life, transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's going to have to be that way. It's going to have to be that way. So back to this friend of ours. She had seen something in our lives that was really different. You're, you're, you're different. You're different. And she loved God. So it wasn't a we're better than you. It wasn't that. And brothers and sisters, you never want to get into something like that with other cr Christians. That wins no arguments. That convinces nobody. You just got to live for Jesus with all of your heart and with all of your life and let the Holy Spirit transform you on a continuing basis. And so we said, okay, this is our experience but experience is not enough for some people, is it? And so we said, okay, you go 
you go back to your room and you make a pro and a con list of the Holy Spirit, because that was her question. Start through the New Testament, make a pro and a con list. And all the verses that are pro, the Holy Spirit is for today in this way, this way, and this way. Make a pro list. And then make a con list. It's not because of this, 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 and this. So she started. And it took her several months. And she started and she'd come down and she'd say, okay, this is how far I am on our list. And she'd show us and she wrote all the scriptures out. And very, very quickly it became apparent that the yes list was this long and the no list was this long. And she kept on digging. But she still had questions. And then she would sometimes come down and, she, and we'd say, pray about it, pray about it. Because she had to be convinced in her heart. we pray about it. And she was so sincere and she was so sincere. And she'd come down, she lived above us on the next floor. And she'd come downstairs after praying. Her hair would be all messed up because she'd really been praying. And her face would be red. And she'd come downstairs and she'd be so frustrated because she was still praying and trying to work it out. Really. And she was sincere. And she was sincere. And then one time she came down and she had it. She was smiling. She was so happy. And she'd figured it out. She hadn't yet received this experience, but she'd figured it out. She says, I found this verse. And see, this verse says that some will do this and some will do this. And so this is not for me. And she was so content. And we looked at her and we said, well, yes, but what about that verse that says this? And she said, oh, she went back upstairs again, <laughs> more digging. And it took several months because she had a lot of questions. But do you know what happened after several months? In her bedroom, by herself, with nobody around. I wasn't there to pray for her and lay hands. Sister Betty wasn't there. What happened? What happened? God answered her sincere questions and filled her with the Holy Spirit. This is an example for you but brothers and sisters, this is true in every area of your life. Do you have real questions? You go to God. Don't let it sit there. He will answer your questions because he's God. And he cares about you. He cares about you. And so we look at this. Jesus is convincing them as he is convincing us that he is living, that he's real, and they can trust him with everything in their lives. But Jesus does something that's kind of unusual. Jesus appears, and then he wh does what? Shoo, he disappears. And then he appears, and then shoo, he disappears. He appears to Mary in the garden. He appears to those disciples on the road to Emmaus, and then gone. He shows up in the room that night with the disciples that are hidden behind the doors. And then he's gone again because at some point they go up to Galilee fishing. And then Jesus appears again by the side of the lake. Let me ask you something this morning. And you say, Pastor Jennifer, what does this have to do with us? It has a lot to do with us. A lot to do with us. Why would Jesus act that way with his followers? Why would he appear, disappear? He, brothers and sisters, he's only got 40 days with them at this point. 40 days, that's it. Wouldn't you think that it would be better just to stay with them night and day, 24-7, never leave their side, be there with them all the time, answer every question, be with them night and day. When they go to sleep, they see him there. When they wake up in the morning, there he is with them. Wherever they go, he's with them. But he doesn't. He appears and he disappears. What is he doing and what does it mean to you and to me this morning? First of all, let's look at some of the scriptures again. Uh, slide four, Matthew 28, 20. What do we say? Jesus told them, this was after his resurrection, be sure of this. Huh? Be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. John 20, 29. Aha. Uh -huh. Blessed are those, this is after his resurrection, who what? Believe. Believe without seeing me. Hey, how many of you have seen Jesus? Do you believe? Yes. Blessed are you, says Jesus. Blessed are you. That's what Jesus says. Okay? No joke. That's, those aren't just nice little words. Jesus says, blessed are you. You haven't seen, but you believe. And then, look at the next verse. He says... 
I'll ask the Father. He'll give you another advocate. We've talked a lot about the Holy Spirit. All of this you know. He's the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. Got questions about the Holy Spirit? But you what? Know Him because He lives with you. <laughs> hey, this was before the resurrection. Who was living with them at that time? Was the Holy Spirit with them at that time? No, who was living with them? Who was it? Jesus. It's Jesus. He says He lives with you. Who was living with them? Jesus was living with them. This helps us to know more about the Holy Spirit and His nature and His character. But then He says, because He lives with you now and later what? Will be in you. In you. And so He's talking about the time, remember after the resurrection, that night in the room, He breathes on them and He says what? Receive the Holy... John 20, 22. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. And so he says, that time's coming. He's with you now. He will be in you. He'll be in you. So put all of these verses together. Jesus appearing, disappearing. What is he doing for his disciples then? And what is he doing for his disciples now? Jesus. He was preparing for them. Preparing what, Sister Alma? He would go away in the Holy Spirit. He's going to go away, but the Holy Spirit's going to come. But is Jesus really going to leave them? physically, right? He's preparing them to, he's trying to wean them off of the physical. We see you. We hear you. We touch you. We see you eat broiled fish, okay? To go back to that. But he wants them to know, though you cannot see me, hear me, touch me, feel me, I'm still going to be with you. Holy Spirit's going to be in you. You can count on me. You can depend on me. You can trust me when I say this to you. Now, why is this important for you and for me? He does the same thing to you and to me as well. How many of you remember in your early days as a Christian? Remember when you were a new Christian? Oh, how wonderful was it to be a brand new Christian? How wonderful? Oh, like angels. That's right, Pastor Fiat. Like angels. You just felt, you felt his overflowing presence. Your heart was full of joy. You knew that you were saved. You would pray and ask God, God, would you? And before you had finished your prayer, God had answered your prayer. Almost. You know what I mean? Yes. Right? Oh, what a wonderful and a glorious thing. And then you kept on walking with the Lord. And some of those things have changed, haven't they? Now, is God lying or telling the truth? He wants you and me to learn the same lessons those early disciples learned. He says, I'm with you always. You don't feel him. He is with you. You don't hear him. Sometimes God is silent, isn't he? God, where are you? God, where are you? And you have to stand on his word. I'm with you always, but I don't hear you. You don't see him. You don't get an answer to prayer. How many of you, you have been praying for years for something and the answer has not yet come? You, yes or no? I have. I'm praying for my brother. Years now and the answer has not yet come. God, are you there? God, do you care? God, do you really hear and answer prayer? Lord, your word says in James chapter 5, the prayers of a righteous person are powerful and produce wonderful results. Haven't seen it yet. Haven't seen it yet. God is moving us on in him so that we trust him when he says, I'm with you. I'm always with you. You don't feel me? I'm with you. You don't see me? I'm with you. You don't hear me? I'm with you. I'm with you. And you and I... Jesus is bringing us into the same thing as he did with his disciples. He has to. He has to. If we are going to go and work and walk with him in this world, it's, it's got to be this way. It's got to be this way. You and I condemn ourselves and we feel like, what have I done wrong? Have you ever felt that? I've done something wrong. Now, by the way, sometimes we have done something wrong. We have. We have. And we've grieved the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that, right? And when you have, because the Holy Spirit is a person, it hurts. It hurt, it, there is hurt on his part. So if you've done something wrong, you make it right, brothers and sisters. You, do, you make it right. You take care of it. You take care of it. But if you don't feel him, 
You don't automatically say, well, I've sinned. I've done something bad. God's mad with me. He's far away from me. He wants you to know he's with you. He's with you just as he did, just as he did with them. It's time to stop. It's time to stop. What God says is true. Now, I can tell you my experience as we come to a close right now. I've walked with God for more than 40 years now, almost 50 years, almost 50 years. And I've never come to the place in my experience where I've gotten an answer from God that I thought, eh, that's the answer? That's a bad answer. That's a false answer. That's a fake answer. I'm disappointed. This is, this is not good. God is not who he says he is. But you have to know this for yourself. And you and I have to come to the place where what God says to us in his word, don't you let it sit there. If what he says is not what you have yet experienced, don't just say, that's the way it is. Don't be lazy. Don't be a lazy Christian. But you and I come to the place where, God, this is in your word, and I don't yet have that in my life, but I want to. You dig in. You press on. And he will meet your needs. He will answer your questions. And he will be God to you. As he was for those disciples. As he was for Christians throughout the ages who have faced things as difficult as we have faced, who have faced issues and questions the same as we have. God is God. You can trust him. And you can dig in. And it's true. And he's real. Don't settle for where you are if you have questions now. Don't settle with what you have if you think, well, this is good enough. There's always more. And he will meet every question and answer every doubt. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer this morning.